Zechariah chapter 11 was specific to the wicked shepherds. And at the end of chapter 11, we were talking specifically about what we assumed and guessed and did a little research on and kind of came away with the conclusion, at least I did, I don't know if you were with me 100%, that, that that ultimate shepherd who had the withered arm and the eye that was darkened, that might have been a reference to the Antichrist himself. Uh, and that, that now you're going to look at a timeline. You're starting to see a timeline develop in Zechariah chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14 because Yah had been talking about how he was going to rescue his people. We started that in chapters 8 and 9. Then in chapter 10, he starts talking about you know, shepherds and how there's wicked shepherds over Israel. Then he gets to bigger shepherds and ultimately an anti-shepherd who wants to destroy Israel. You can kind of see that there's a timeline going on there. And he's still on this same timeline. And when we read chapters 12, 13, and 14, which we are actually going to do tonight, we're going to, do, we're going to finish up this book. Don't misunderstand. We, we are not finishing the book of Zechariah tonight. What we are going to do, Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14 are so tightly integrated together, they're all talking about the same thing. It wouldn't make any sense to me to just read chapter 12 and then 11 and then, you know, you know what I'm saying? 12 and then 13 and then 14. Uh, it would just kind of break it up too much. So I want you to sense this timeline. Yeshua is revealing to the prophet Zechariah what is going to happen in my estimation in these three chapters. He's describing what you have commonly heard of as the day of the Lord. When I say the day of the Lord, what does that conjure up in your mind? What does that make you think of? What is the day of the Lord? Do you know? You have any last ideas? The last great day is another euphemism for it. Yes. Who is it? It's Keith. Tell us, Keith, what's your opinion on the issue? Day of judgment. Yes, Keith is absolutely right. Uh, as far as we can tell from many of the prophets, the day of the Lord is quite dark and gloomy and terrible. But it's also what, Keith? Judgment comes upon the earth. For everyone? For everyone. Including all believers? That's right. You, you, you can still be judged whether you're righteous or not. Fair but enough. I mean, you're going to go in front of Yeshua's throne either first or, or later on. Fair enough, so. yeah. Okay. So, and, and you know, here's something that people often have, uh, you know, deep discussions about, and there's a lot of confusion. In fact, we talked about this a little bit last time, is having the perception that, you know, it, that's not for you. In fact, I think I mentioned to you last time that as you study the book of Zechariah and all judgment passages are automatically delegated to the Jews. Those evil Jews are going to have destruction and death and everything and all of us Christians are going to be rescued. So this is, isn't that a wonderful, that's a wonderful uh, story. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's true. And I think, you know what's fascinating? Uh, wasn't it you, Bryce, who sent out that message on Discord regarding uh, Tucker Carlson and that country singer? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I got a chance to listen to that a little bit more in depth this week, and I was kind of interested to hear him talk about these passages in, in Thessalonians, which I think is happening a lot these days with Christians starting to wake up and open up their Bibles and go, okay, I need to study this stuff because something's weird going on out in the world. We talked about that last time. So what's interesting is you're starting to see a lot of people waking up. Uh, and starting to pay attention to what's happening in the world and starting to open up their Bibles. Yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. People are opening up their Bibles and seeing what it says. And, and, you know, Keith is absolutely right that there is great judgment on the nations in the day of the Lord. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think that Keith meant to say that, you know, the judgment is upon everyone. Everyone should is very much worthy of being judged. Uh, but I also think that there are a lot of passages regarding salvation for the elect in those days, right? That, now, that does not mean, as Keith pointed out, can somebody get him a microphone? Uh, I, just, I, just point. I think Keith meant that they were, believers were being 
judged, but like a, a favorable judgment. I don't know if that's what Keith meant. Do you want? Do you want to let her, uh, talk about that just briefly, Keith? Paul talks about your deeds and everything. If they're put in front of the fire, what's left? Right. Right. To show, a lot of people don't. I don't. I interpret that as it's not such physical things. Because you're going to do deeds, but your deeds should be saving souls, mm -hmm. and souls won't burn in fire. So it's almost as if. Paul, even in his letters, he's going back to the, the people he writes to, trying to keep them straight, because those are souls that he's trying to save. He mm -hmm. wants them to make it through, you know, through yeah. the uh, throne when they stand in front of Yeshua. Right. Sure, they, they are blessed because they believe, right. but at the same time, those will be accounted to him right. because of his work and effort to bring them forth to the throne. And I'm glad that I'm glad that thank you for sharing that, Keith. I'm glad that Keith brought that to our attention because I don't I'm hoping that no one feels, especially in this Hebrew roots movement, it feels like I, I'm doing a great job and I'm gonna be saved because I'm righteous <laughs> and I'm keeping Shabbat. <laughs> that is not that is not an accurate statement. Uh, I do not think that you should have a, a haughty attitude, for example, thinking, well, we're Torah observant now. Of course, we're going to be rescued from any, any trouble or any difficulty. No, 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 no. Um, I think that's what's waking up a lot of Christians is they're, they're starting to open their Bibles and they're starting to hear people talking and they're going, you know, I don't think we're being rescued from this. And they're facing the possibility the very real likelihood that they're going to have to face some difficulty. Yeshua was pretty clear about it. If you read, you know, Matthew chapter 24 or Luke 21 or Mark 13, it's pretty clear that there is trouble in store for everybody. Now, I do want to reiterate that there is a tremendous blessing and a salvation for the people of God. There absolutely is. Who that is going to be, where in the world, I have no idea. Somebody has to be saved, right? Because you know how many passages there are in both the New Testament and the Old Testament about believers being saved in that day? Tons and tons and tons of them. And we also have lots of examples, as Paul tells us, these things were written for you upon whom the ages of the ages have come. So any deliverance uh, miracles and, and things that you see happen in the Old Testament whether it's the Exodus, whether it's Lot, escaping from Sodom and Gomorrah, you should expect to see those things again. Whether it's Elijah eating, you know, from the widow's, the poor widow's food for months and months, being fed by birds. There are so many passages in the prophets about salvation for the people of Yah at the end of the days that I think that you should, you know, what does Yeshua say? Pray that you be worthy to escape all the things that are coming upon the earth. Now, I, I don't know how you could be worthy of that. I would suggest one thing you could be humble. If I was to make one suggestion based upon any one of you hearing my voice here or on the internet saying, I would love to experience the salvation of Yah in the final days if we are in the final days. And even if we're not in the final days, I'd still like to experience the salvation of Yah in my daily life. Humility is the key, 100%. Humility and repentance, 100%. So let that just resonate around with you. So I'm going to read this for you, and my supposition is, and I want you to consider this, that chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the book of Zechariah are dealing with the time period immediately, uh, the part of the great, tribu the tr great Tribulation, I think it's describing part of the Great Tribulation, and the wrath of the Father being poured out on the nations that surround Jerusalem. So let's read that together. We're going to have an extended story time with Uncle Alan. Uh, in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. So I'm going to share my slides with you now. And let's uh, open up our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12. I am reading, I believe, from the Holman Christian Standard. But let's see what we've got here. Here's what it says. The burden of the word of Yah for Israel. Thus said Yah, 
which stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, there's that day, said Yah, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in Yah of hosts, their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Yah also shall save the tents of Judah first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall Yah defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of Yah before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn." In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shammai apart, and their wives apart all the families that remain, every family part apart and their wives apart. Zechariah 13. On that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the residents of Jerusalem to wash away sin and impurity. On that day, this is the declaration of Yah of hosts, I will erase the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered. I will remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. If a man still prophesies, his father and his mother who bore him will say to him, You cannot remain alive, because you have spoken falsely in the name of Yah. When he prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will pierce him through. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive. He will say, I am not a prophet. I work the land, for a man purchased me as a servant since my youth. If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your chest? Then he will say, I received the wounds in the house of my friends. Sword, awake against my shepherd, against the man who is my associate. This is the declaration of Yah of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will also turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, this is Yah's declaration, two thirds will be cut off and die but a third will be left in it. I will put this third through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, Yah is our Elohim. A day of Yah is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured. The houses looted and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. Then Yah will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. 
The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley, so that, the, so that half of the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Azal. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yah, my Elohim, will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be no light. The sunlight and moonlight will diminish. It will be a day known only to Yah, without day or night, but there will be light at evening. On that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea, in summer and winter alike. On that day Yah will become king over all the earth. Yah alone, and His name alone. All the land from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, will be changed into a plain. But Jerusalem will be raised up and will remain on its site from the Benjamin Gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the Tower of Hananel to the royal wine presses. People will live there, and never again will there be a curse of complete destruction. So Jerusalem will dwell in security. This will be the plague that Yah strikes all the people with, who have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. On that day, a great panic from Yah will be among them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hand of one will rise against the other. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected gold, silver, and clothing in great abundance. The same plague as the previous one will strike the horses, mules, camels, donkeys, and all the animals that are in those camps. Then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, Yah of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yah of hosts, rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will not go up and enter, then rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague Yah inflicts on the nations who do not go up to celebrate the festival of booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of booths. On that day, the words, Holy to Yah, will be on the bells of the horses. The pots in the house of Yah will be like the sprinkling basins before the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to Yah of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices will come and take some of the pots to cook in. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Yah of hosts. Wow. Wow is right. Yeah, that's uh, that is quite a quite a bit of happening there. So I want to I want to talk with you guys a little bit about this, but I want to have a little bit of an unstructured dialogue with you. Okay, I I, I don't want to. It's a it's a lot to cover, and it's going to take us a little while to kind of break it down because there's a lot happening there for sure. But do you see? Could you tell from listening to me read it that there's a lot connected between those three chapters and it almost seems to be reiterating itself between chapters 11 and 13, or 12 and 14? Uh, well, what is your, if, if you had to say, anyone is welcome to try to answer this question and I know that it's a lot of speculation, but would anyone be willing to tell me what is your perspective about how things go down. Uh, do, uh, anyone have a, an idea about that? I mean, I know it's a tough question and it's very complex, but I'm happy to, uh, hey, hey, go ahead, Hayden. Something I noticed is it sounded, and maybe I got the sequence wrong, but it sounded like it said, um, they will say God is our God and God will say they are my people. And then immediately thereafter, it talks about the city getting captured and all the women are raped mm -hmm. and half of them are exiled. Yeah, does that kind of give so, you the impression, if you're reading this like we are sequentially, that might give you the idea that 
we got good stuff and then bad stuff and then good stuff and then bad stuff if you're reading it as a chronological sequence. But you also have to consider the possibility that it's giving you a vignette of what's going to happen and then it gives you another vignette of the same happening and then another vignette of the same happening over and over and over. That's something that you have to consider. I know Angela has something she'd like to say. Do you not? You do not. Okay. You came in here like you had something you wanted to say. Uh, Michael, would you assist me by handing that back over towards Lou? So yes, that's an excellent insight, Hayden. Uh, and I would say, keep your mind on the possibility that we're reading chronologically or we're reading about the same event over and over and over with different language to describe it. That's something we have to consider. Lou? Well, just like you said, if you read it over and over again, mm -hmm. And it depends on who's reading this, how they might take it. Yeah, yeah. And some, that may, well. Well, how, I'm gonna, I want to ask you to elaborate on that, Lou. You said it depends on the person reading it. Why is that? Well, because if you don't believe in God, then he's telling you what's going to happen. That's okay, so you could be an unbeliever reading this and think, I, I don't even know if I believe that stuff. Yeah. Okay, right. it just said, sound like some fastical, fantastical fairy tale. Right. But also, Lou, you might have two, three, four different Christians who believe in God read this passage and take away something very different from it. Why might that be? That might be. And you know what I thought, and I'm probably way off, <coughs> but I have struggled and struggled with why are we against the Jewish people? I guess that they're not a race, I know, but right, it's those, right. the, the Jewish, whatever. But why are we against that? Uh, you know, that's a fabulous, fabulous question. And the only answer that I have ever come up with to satisfy myself is that it's a spiritual sickness, right. that it's a spiritual hatred. There's nothing <clears throat> rational to explain why everybody hates the Jews and certainly not Christians. I mean, Paul warned us sternly against that in, in the in the near the end of the book of Romans, you know, about being grafted in and you don't, don't lift yourself up as a righteous, cool branch. He did it to them. He cut you off. So he's, he's pretty bold in saying, Hey, for the sake of the gospel, they're kind of like enemies to you. But in regards to the promises of God, they're your brothers. So this is a really challenging situation. And I, I got to tell you, I've mentioned this to you before, but if you go and read any one of the biblical commentaries on these three chapters of Zechariah, every single one of them says, that's talking about the great destruction that's going to happen for the Jews at the end. And then you can tell in chapter, I think you can tell in chapter 12, where he there's some language there's like, they will look on him whom they pierced. What you, you, I mean, you as Christians have some strong ideas about that, I'm sure. Now, what does that signify? Okay, we'll have to deal with that. Bob, what do you got for me, brother? Well, I think so many people have kind of issues with um, Jewish religion because they rejected the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And I think that for those that were believers in him in the very beginning that did not reject him, it created that animosity between the two that continues to survive to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good that's a good insight, Bob. And I would say, you know, we have long collective memories, and I think that you know, if you want to go all the way back to the beginning, Christians were persecuted by Jews right at the beginning. Paul is a perfect example of that. But then, once the Christians gained ascendancy, they flipped the script on the Jews, and they began to persecute and destroy them. Unfortunately, they have not risen to a position of prominence again to have the ability to persecute anybody. Until now. Now whether you think they're persecuting someone over there in the Middle East, that's not what I'm talking about. They have some power, some power right now, not a tremendous amount. Are they a powerful nation? In the neighborhood where they live, they are, but it's not a great neighborhood. 
Do you know what I'm saying? So as far as neighborhoods go, that's not a tremendously powerful neighborhood. You're living in the most powerful neighborhood on the planet. Well, maybe not quite the most powerful, but close. Uh, Bob, what do you got for me, brother? I actually just kind of went blank on what it was I was going to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's kind of along the lines of what I was just saying a minute ago, that God is going to take his punishment out on the Jewish nation that turned their back on Yeshua back then. And there are still so many carrying forward to this state that he's going to take it out on them continually until they finally figure out that, yes, Yeshua is the Messiah, and they bend the knee. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you have a perspective that is a little bit different than mine. I don't necessarily say that I disagree with you, but that, I think, is a common idea among Christians is that the Jews are being punished continuously for the last 2,000 years for rejecting Yeshua. I have a hard time with that. I do not believe that that is what the issue is. Now, do we know for a fact that since 69, 68 AD, the Jews have been thrashed and beaten and tortured and killed and crucified and beat up on this planet? Yes. Is that all for the last 2,000 years been because they have, they, because they have uh, rejected Messiah? Uh, what, is that not what you were saying, Bob? No, I, I'm not saying that it's all of them. Oh, Okay. But you think, you, you think that the wrath of God is still being poured out on the Jews because of rejection of Yeshua? Exactly. Okay, and right. Then when you've got the Messianic Jews that still believe in Yeshua, they're going to be a little bit more scared compared to the <coughs> Orthodox or something that has completely rejected them up to this day. Okay, so I see where you're coming from, and, and, and I, I still disagree with you. I see with the point that you're making, but what I would say is I have a hard time looking back over the last 2,000 years and saying that Jews, and I'm not saying entirely, but I have a problem saying that all of the tragic things that have happened to the Jews are because of Yeshua, because they rejected Yeshua. That's the Christian theology that says, well, yeah, they're being punished for rejecting Yeshua. I would say that's kind of true, but it's too narrow, okay? If you want to say they rejected Yeshua, that's okay, but let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. What I'm going to suggest is to you that they didn't just reject Yeshua, they rejected the Word of God entirely. Yeshua is the Word of God. So you see what I'm saying? But it makes a difference how you view it. If you say, well, they're experiencing all this tragedy for the last 2,000 years because they rejected Yeshua. That reeks of someone being punished for something they didn't do. And I believe that God is not a punisher of people for things that they didn't do. And he also does not hold, each man is responsible for his own sin, okay? So if you're raised as a Jew, and the Christians have lied to you about Yeshua in general, and you're like, yeah, that can't be my Messiah, right? Because that guy eats pork and worships on weird holy days, and he made up a bunch of stuff that isn't in the Torah, and he rejects the Torah, and the, his, all of his followers hate Jews. That is not my Messiah. Okay, so we're saying God's going to hold those people accountable because they were because they were blinded by the lies of our own people and the lies of their, their elders who said, do not pay attention to what those Christians say. Now, I have a problem with attributing God meeting out this dynamic, crazy punishment for 2,000 years based upon them rejecting Yeshua 2,000 years ago. I do not believe that. What I do believe is that they are His special covenant people. They made a pledge as a wife to a husband standing under that hoopah of the mountain at Sinai and said, whatever you say, we will do it. They made a pledge of fealty and obedience, the whole nation. And the whole nation is responsible to it. Yeshua is definitely a part of that. But they, were, they have, so many of them have rejected the whole covenant. They have rejected the word. 
They have gone, you know that Jews are just like any of us. How many people are really religious, really love God in the United States? 10%, if you're lucky. How many of the Jews are really zealous for God and humble? It's about the same. If you look at the statistics, it's about 10%. Some of them are Messianic Jews. Some of them are just Orthodox Jews. Now, I, in my mind, look at a man will be judged by his humility and his repentance. Yeshua is a big part of that. Do not hear me saying that I'm not elevating Torah above Yeshua. I am absolutely not. Yeshua is critical to this equation. But we have to change the language a little bit because you start saying, well, the Jews have been punished for 2,000 years and they still got some punishment to come because they rejected Yeshua 2,000 years ago. That's just not going to sit well with a lot of people and I don't think it's accurate. That's just my opinion. I know Bob has a, a little difference of opinion and it's okay because we're talking about nebulous stuff here. We're talking about the will of God and, and things that are way outside of our purview. I'm simply giving you my opinion on a subject. Lou, I cannot allow you to speak yet. I apologize, buddy. You just grab that mic as a Johnny come lately, and I got a couple of people online that have okay. been holding for some time. Hold on to your thought, though. Write it down. I will. I don't know who was first, but I think it might be David. Go, David. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, they, are, they are the opposite. They? You talking about the Jews? I'm talking about Israel. Israel, okay. <laughs> there you go. I, I tend to think, by the way, uh, everyone thinks of let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question real quick, David. When you say the Hebrew people or the Israelites, however you want to say that, do you include like lost tribes or do you include like Christians under that ten tribes kind of thing? Are you a uh, are you a two tribes kind of thing? Or the Lord. Okay. Whoever so, is faith before the Lord is part of Israel. So you would probably include Christians in that equation. That is correct. Thank you. I think those who are straight before the Lord. Okay. But, but by the way, I do believe that there's, okay, there's part of my Bible study that says, yeah, we're kind of like Samaria. We're like Egypt. We're like a bunch of things that are in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, life in uh, as sisters. I don't think one sister is dead. Mm. I think both sisters are still kicking their descendants. Mm -hmm. And he, like a good sower of seed, he has scattered them everywhere. Yeah. It's not it's, it's, it's not very humble to think it's only in America. I believe that there are descendants all over the planet. Thank you. Good insight. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Excellent. But, but I don't think they're being punished at this point. In fact, I want to thank them for, for preserving the Torah. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good insight. Good insight, buddy. Um, Bob, I think that you were up next. Bob? Or Maureen? I, I, just, I, I just wanted to say real quick, Al, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Uh, I, absolutely. One of the things that I have to look at is so many Jews that have been persecuted since way back when, some of those people are going to be tested by God's fire and their martyrdom because so many are innocent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not about you know, God punishing them per se as it is he's, he's pulling out his people out of it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good insight. Uh, Maureen, did you want to say something, or was that an accident? No, no accident. Oh, tell us what you got. Um, well, I think that a large part of the hatred for the Jewish people, and I agree with David, all Jewish people are Israelites, not all Israelites are Jewish. Yes. And I think the Israelites are the people of God. Yeah. That is a great, great insight, Maureen. I really appreciate you saying that. And I would encourage each of you 
to when you look at your Bible and you read your Bible talking about how some are saved and some are destroyed. He's talking about Israel, not just Jews, and that you are Israel. He's talking about you. We have oftentimes comforted ourselves with the idea, man, none of that bad stuff that's described in the Bible is talking about me because I'm a, I'm a Christian. That's Jewish people or that's Israel. It's very clearly talking about Israel, but everyone forgets that Paul tells us quite clearly, you are Israel. You are grafted into Israel. So you can't say, that's not me. Well, if that's not you, then you're not a part of Israel. You're not saved. You're not part of the kingdom. You're not part of the family, period. That's a problem. You got a problem on your hands. So I'm going to, oh, did you, could, are you still talking, Maureen? I apologize. Go ahead. Um, well, so the problem, I think that the hatred of the Israelites is that they have made this grave error in denying Yeshua all those years ago, and they are still God's chosen people. Yes. And the world knows it. Yes. And I think that's a large part of the of the anti-Semitism. Yes, absolutely. Good insight. I'm going to Osmundo. Uh, Jerry, give me a thumbs up if you had something to say. I'm not going to give you an opportunity. Okay, good. I'm coming back to you in just a sec, Jerry. I want to ask a question, though, and maybe Osmundo will touch on this. Maybe he won't. But we have often said the Jews rejected Jesus. They rejected Yeshua. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible for a Christian to reject Jesus? Now, I'm not talking about falling away from the faith. I am not talking about falling away from the faith. Oh, I got baptized when I was 12, and I went to church from the time I was 12 until the time I was 30, and then I, I backslid. I forgot about God. I never went to church again. I started drinking and doing drugs and whoring around, and, you know, Jesus shows up, and, oh, my gosh, I forgot to get my ticket punched. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, is it possible to be a professing believer and reject Jesus? Yes. How is that possible? <clears throat> Osmundo, would you like to tell me about that? You, would uh, you like to also say something, Angela? Good. I'm coming to you and Lou in just a moment. Go ahead. Uh, this is in addition to what other stuff I was going to say, but I would say yes, because it's clear that if you will give instructions of all the teachings of first and being obedient to God's commands. Yes. And there are majority of Christians, I would say, what? Be careful. Be careful, Osmundo. <laughs> majority, I'll say, some, how about some? Let's be generous. Okay, let's be generous. Some. <laughs> some. I would, say, I would say, in my experience, the majority that I have encountered, okay. they, they have, they say, well, we're no longer under the law, we're under grace, and they misunderstand Paul's teachings in Romans. And so I've had a hard, the hardest time I've had ministering was to those who are Christian as opposed to those who are not and they're just coming into the faith. Those who are Christian reject Yeshua's teachings I, and I actually have arguments, you know, I mean, you get caught up into the arguments, right? Yeah. You're talking to somebody and they get very contentious and you're trying to answer them and they're over talking and next you know you're in a verbal battle. Sure. Okay, no, that's... Okay, so hold on to that. Hold on to that thought for just a second, Osmundo, because I want to inject into what you just said a little, and I'm going to give you a second to go over what your other point was. But you mentioned, well, there are Christians who reject the Torah, so that's a problem. Okay, granted. I got no problem with that. Should Christians obey all of the commandments of God? Yes, they should. But that's not exactly what I'm talking about. But you're making a decent point. What I'm also saying is, is it possible for a, be a professing believer to have really no interest in obeying Jesus, even the commands that they do know, that are not, a, that not inclusive of the Torah? That's very common. So, could you say there are tons of people sitting in church on Sunday morning who love going, they love listening to the music, they love saying hi to people, but they really don't have any interest in hearing what God is saying to them? They really don't have any interest in being <clears throat> obedient. They just like going to church. Is that possible? 
very yes, possible. Ritual. Those yeah. that's ritualistic. That's almost like a Pharisee kind of thing. It's exactly like a Pharisee kind of thing. These are religious people. So is it possible that you could reject Yeshua and yet be counted among these one billion Christians on the planet? Yes, a hundred percent. Sorry, Osmundo, I'm coming around to you again, buddy. Just wanted to clarify oh, yeah, that I mean, point. Just to piggyback off of that, you're absolutely right. Um, I remember when I was in the, the, in the church and I was talking to You're still in the church, brother. <laughs> My first got saved, right? No, you're still, if you ain't part of the church, no, I'm talking about when I was the, the you're talking about that church. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm messing with you, brother. And, um, I know. And so, <laughs> I was saying, it, it, just, it, it just poured out of me like the spirit, you know, God's spirit was speaking through me. And back then, this was like the late 90s, early 2000s. And I said out of my mouth, I said, the coming of Jesus is going to be like a fad. And over the years, it, it, it proved to be true. So when you look at people, just like, you know, you look at the Grammys, right? They say, oh, I thank God for this, and blankety blank, and they're cussing out their mouth, and, you know, we're not to use foul language, right? The Bible talks about that. Um, and there's things that they, the life that they live is contrary to God's word, but the fact that they say, I'm a Christian, and oftentimes people say they are Christians, but they don't show any example of what Christ is like. Mm -hmm. And all his teachings they reject. Mm -hmm. Even in the, in the teachings of Paul, they reject, mm -hmm. not necessarily directly or intently, but mm -hmm. just the way they live their lives and the way they care for themselves. Yep. There are a ton of people who are rejecting God daily, even though they're professing believers. Very common. Very common. Sorry. Now, I'm going to Jerry, then Lou, then Angela. Sorry, Jerry. You're very patient. Isn't he a patient man? No, I can't hear you, brother. You haven't unmuted yourself. Try it again. There you go. Oh, to my, my thought on why people do not like to do this is it goes all the way back to Genesis 2, I believe, when God made the promise to Eve that she would have a seed and that that seed would, be, would do something. And that seed became Christ. Hmm. And that particular seed would redeem the people. Mm. And then as you move along the timeline, in the time of Esther, when there was a king, decided he was going to put this degree out, mm. and we're going to kill all the Jews. Mm. That, didn't, that didn't work. Satan was behind all that. That didn't work. Yeah. I believe that Satan, Satan and God are at odds. Yeah. They do not care for each other. Satan hates right. God. Satan wants to be God. Right. The only can become God is if you can to stop God's plan, which is to redeem the people. Yeah. That's to Yeshua. He tried to do it by killing Yeshua. That didn't work. God raised him from the dead. Yeah. So are you say, so are you saying then that you think that maybe the the reason that you're seeing persecution of God's people, covenant people, is because of these persecutors are the seed of the serpent? Yeah, basically because. The serpent wants to be one. If he can kill all, if he can kill, if he can break all the promises that God gave to Israel, then he wins. He becomes God. Yeah, that's a. If God can't keep that promise, then Satan becomes God. That's a God. that's a fascinating take on that, Jerry. And I think you might have something there. But I would say, you know, we got to consider that uh, it, people who are against Israel. Yeah, that sounds like. I mean, I see what the people uh, that are against Israel out there doing in the world, and I'm like, those don't strike me. Those don't strike me as righteous people. <laughs> you know, they're burning and looting things and yelling and screaming and spitting in people's face and saying, we're for the violence cult. And I'm like, uh, that sure seems like somebody who's demon infested to me. Uh, sorry, Jerry. Yeah, but you're right. You're right, brother. I, I would have to agree with you 100%. Um, don't forget you mute yourself again. I am going to you, Lou. I apologize for making you wait, but you're such a patient young man. I know. Well, I think we're forgetting something. Tell me what you think we're forgetting. Well, Yeshua said on the cross, what did he say when he was being crucified? Forgive them so they don't know what they're doing. And when Stephen was getting stoned to death. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
Exactly. And I think we should remember that. Sometimes we don't forgive. And, you know, even when we think they don't know what they're doing, but <laughs> but that's what God said. Yeah. And, and forgiveness, now to me, forgiveness is the big thing. Yeah, yeah. That's a great insight. And I think... Um, we need to remember that about a lot of our brothers and sisters. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. How about that? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Those are the hard words to say. Forgive me. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Angela, you got a microphone. Um, it's kind of what you, you already you asked if a Christian can reject Jesus. And I was thinking the same thing you said that, uh, yeah, if you've made, if, if the Jesus that you are accepting and following isn't actually Jesus, but instead is your golden calf or this image that you've created in your own mind. And you could be like a Pharisee who thinks that they're following the right thing, doing the right thing, but because what's actually true doesn't line up with your doctrine or your leaven, then you call it bad mm -hmm. and you call it heretical mm -hmm. and, or you call it a cult or, you know, you, 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 you bad mouth it because it doesn't line up with what you think, yeah. which is your leaven. And so I was thinking there's that question about leaven is leaven wrong teaching or is leaven pride? Because you hear people go at it from both those angles. I'm thinking that leaven or that bad teaching or bad doctrine and pride go together like peas and carrots. Yeah. And that um, <laughs> peas and carrots. <laughs> that that it's when you're humble that you're actually correctable. Like what Deb just said when she said, "Forgive us." <laughs> It, you, if you're not humble, and you, you started this whole teaching by saying it's humble is what's going to rescue you. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, would you hand that over to Cynthia? I'm going over to Joe is not in the habit of asking questions. I am delighted, unless he pushed the button on accident. Let's just find out. Joe, did you push the button on purpose? Maybe, maybe he's trying to unmute himself. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's dancing around on the keyboard right now, trying to figure out what to do. Okay, I tried, Joe. You do not go past go. You do not collect two hundred dollars. Okay, come back to me if you decide. Oh, whoa! All right. Oh, hi, Elena. I'm sorry. I, I'm listening. I'm listening to the Bible study, and I was. Uh, we're about to get a, some rain here, and I was uh, dealing with some stuff outside, so I had to, I had I had my phone in my back pocket. I was listening to you all, but I gotta apologize. I'm You're sorry. pushing. No, that's okay. Reason. You're pushing you know, buttons on accident. I was fidgeting with the phone, trying to figure out uh, how to on my mic that's so okay apologize. no that's okay well you batten down the hatches buddy did you you didn't have anything you wanted to say did you uh no okay i'm glad well you you batten down the hatches um was someone else yeah. gonna talk oh it was cindy sorry go ahead cindy and then i'll come back to you in just a moment keith i heard oh. someone i heard someone explain this just recently and i thought it was really insightful so they were talking about, you know, in Exodus where God told us to have the, this is based off of what Angie was talking about. Um, when you have the manna, you're not supposed to have the manna and keep it for days ahead. You're right. supposed to have it for One that day. day. Time, yeah. And they applied it to when you learn, what you learn from God's word that he gives you daily. Mm -hmm. You don't hold on to it, mm -hmm. but you take it the next day. It's like yeah. precept upon precept yeah. thing. I never thought of looking at it that way. You know what? I, I want to briefly just pigeon, play off of what you just said. Um, and I'm coming to you, Keith, I promise, but I have to reconnect with what Cindy just said because I had a, uh, remember this week, both of my sons will testify that I had journaled something about um, being controlled by my flesh. Okay? Like, I mean, 
I'm controlled by my physical desires for, you know, drink and food and sexuality and, and inputs. And then I started thinking about intellectual inputs. You know what I'm saying? It's like taking in stuff. And I began to think about, man, uh, how many people do I know and I, I myself can sometimes be getting fire hosed with videos or podcasts or whatever that I'm listening to and I have no ability to absorb all that information. It can't get through. It's going into my ears, but it's not penetrating into my skull. It's certainly not getting down into my heart. So I actually began this week, the, over the last week, this is what I did. I said, I am not going to listen to a bunch of sermons. I'm going to listen, if I'm going to listen to any sermons, I'm going to listen to one sermon. And if I want to listen to a sermon again, I'm going to listen to the same sermon. And if I want to listen to a sermon again, I'm going to listen to the same sermon. That's, that way, if I feel like this teacher has something to say to me, let me really absorb it, you know? And I also decided I probably ought to not listen to sermons too much because that's man's opinion about what the Word says. And that's great. We all need good teachers. But it cannot substitute for hearing the word of God yourself. Listening and not hearing God. Yes. So I just wanted to riff off of what you were saying, Cindy, and that is, man, we can get so connected to these ideas, but having so many teachers coming at us from five different teachers that we follow on YouTube or whatever, it's like we're never really, we're just getting our ears tickled with fascinating little tidbits from the Torah and tidbits from here and, oh, did you know this? And, oh, did you know that? We're, that's basically Gnosticism. Yep. We are so excited about secret knowledge, mm -hmm. hidden knowledge. Yeah. What? <clears throat> what? Yeah. Microphone back to her, please. Thank you. Apologize. Coming, coming back to you, Keith. I'm sorry. It, we talked the circus ride. Yes, that, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a teacher this week who said, you know, you guys get so excited about all these little doodads and the Hebrew and the little nuggets that you find. And it's a lot of fun, like a circus ride. You get on and you're like, wee, that was a lot of fun. She goes, and when you get off the ride, you're in the same spot you were before. You didn't take you anywhere. You made no progress, but you sure had a great time. Yeah. And that's what some of that this stuff has felt like for Absolutely. The, year, the years we've been doing it. Absolutely. It has. Hand that over to Velma. You are so right that I'm like, man, we got to do better than that. Just filling our minds with all these tasty <laughs> tidbits about the scripture. But it's like going on a circus ride. And then we get off the ride and we're standing in the exact same spot we were before. But we sure had a great time. We were entertained. Our ears were tickled and we learned all kinds of nifty stuff that had not a hill of beans difference in our life. We're still the same people we were 50 years ago. That is not the way our religion is supposed to work. <laughs> I'm so sorry to tell you. That is a failure on our part. We are not humble. We are not hearing the parable of the sower. Yes, Osmundo is pointing out. Keith, I apologize for rambling, sir. Would you still like to speak, or have I totally stolen your thunder, or have you forgotten oh, what you were going to say? Okay, gar sorry. Go ahead, Keith. Well, right now, what Jerry was saying, you know, this idea of the Jews, I mean, all these prophecies, we got to really focus on they are written for that part of the world for those people. Mm. And the seed of the serpent is definitely the problem. Uh, they, you know, that's who's going to persecute anybody who follows God's right. commandments and, and professes Yeshua, or even if you don't profess Yeshua, you keep the Torah. Right. So the seed of the serpent in that area has really been rattled and uh, and really lashing out lately, if you haven't been paying attention, yeah. okay? Islam is moving forward with a lot of plans. <coughs> mm -hmm. We don't know, you know, all of a sudden we've got warships over there, our own warships going to intervene, trying to calm the situation. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of really taking all these, all through the Old Testament, <coughs> even Revelation, they name a bunch of countries and names and they're all from that area and <laughs> I, I think a real good teacher is joel richardson he really looks at that prophetically yeah 
And I just wanted to mention, you know, if, if you want to see a new view on how things, because originally your question was, how do you think things are going to go down? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's got some really interesting, and it's all backed up with prophecy mm -hmm. that matches those lands and the people. And he's a very astute teacher. Yeah. And his, his website's joelstrumpet.com. Mm -hmm. If you go to his resor resources, he's got free books. His book's on PDF for you for free. Yeah. So if you I, just wanted to read something like that and see what, what yeah. he's about. I think, thank you for sharing that, Keith. And I do actually like Joel Richardson quite a bit. He's a, I think he's got some great insights. And I think that his perspective on the serpent seed being from Islam, the Antichrist being an Islamic Mahdi type of situation, I think there's, there's great validity to that. Could that be true? Joel Richardson has just as good a case to make as anybody else. If it, the, the whole idea that has been prominent in Western civilization since the Middle Ages, that it's the Catholics and the Pope and everything, I have a real hard time thinking that way. I don't know why. That just doesn't resonate with me. Um, I have no idea. I really have no idea. I think Joel Richardson has probably some of the better ideas that I've heard, but it's a good, good insight. Sorry, Thelma, go ahead. This just goes along with what Angie was saying about that little ride we go on. <laughs> um, I look at it like we sit down at a table full of food, and there's all kinds of food on that table. And because there's so much food, we don't know what to eat. Mm. So we pick a little bit here, we pick a little bit there, and we're not really getting the nutrients that we need from what God's given us because we're trying to shove it all down mm -hmm. and get a little bit of this and a little bit of that. When realistically, if we take... If you take a book of the Bible and read a couple scriptures, yeah. read that all week. Yeah. Read that for a month. Well, you know, and let I'm, that resonate I'm with so what glad, that means to you. I'm so glad you brought that up because that reminds me of when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they didn't want to eat what God wanted them to eat. Yeah. They wanted something more. They wanted something different. They said, can't we get any meat around here? And you know what he did? He gave them meat until it came out of their nose and they were puking it. And they all, bunch of them, what was it, 24,000 died in a plague. I am guilty. Of Whoa, hold on. Don't speak. My... Don't speak without a microphone. Okay. Sorry. Okay. It was just an add-on. Just... Well, you got to make add-ons. I am guilty microphone. of puking up all of my fantastic tidbits I found. I, I'm, we all are. We all, we yes. all are. You Have, are. Is there I... anyone here who hasn't done that? No. Look at this whole thing I found. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you are correct. We are Sorry. all guilty of running around like a bunch of weirdos going, look at what I found. <laughs> yeah, and taking people on, you know, joy rides around the merry-go-round, and then we just dump them off right where we found them. Uh, yeah, it's, that ain't, <laughs> we're not being terribly helpful. But, you know, we need to figure out, what do we do? What do we do? We, yes, we talked about that last time we got together, which was... Stop looking at the things around you. Start looking at the people around you and figuring out how you can help. Being a servant, being loving. Remember what Yeshua said. People will know you're my disciples if you observe Shabbat. If you circumcise your penis. Bingo. If you don't eat pork. Yes. If you love one another. It's easy to love people. That's a hard one. It's it's to easy to them. love people who are lovely. So easy. I know a few people who are lovely. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. My Thank wife you. is lovely. I love my wife and children. <laughs> but you know what? I know some other people who are harder to love. That's when it's that's when the rubber meets the road. Yes. That's correct. Were you going to say something? He was going to say something. Somebody give him a microphone. Thank you, Cynthia. You were going to say something? Go ahead. She realized she had already said too much. Uh -oh. I'm just kidding. I'll give it I'm kidding, Cindy. No, you're just talking about get, absorbing all this information and just inhaling it, and then that's where you get this more this spiritual feeling Especially when you when you hear a sermon, but especially when you hear some worship music, you go to a service. You got other church members around you. you there's a sermon, right? But I think that's I I get the general impression that people um, I've I've heard it before too, just in conversation. There's this tone that 
says to me, God, God is in that building. Mm. God is in that activity. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this association that says God is in the church building mm -hmm. and God is in sermons mm -hmm. and that you are doing God things when you listen to a sermon mm -hmm. or listen to a teaching or go to a Bible. Makes you study, feel good about yourself. Or we read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then when you pick up To Kill a Mockingbird, it's like, okay, now we're in not God mode. And then you pick up the, the Bible and it's like, okay, now we're in God mode. Mm -hmm. Or you're listening to your friend tell you about their weekend. That's you're not in God mode. You're not talking about Jesus. You're not in God But mode. As soon as the, as soon as the conversation's about Jesus, or we're all in a Jesus setting, it's like okay, now we're we're back in God mode. Yeah. And that's just enforcing this idea that God lives inside of these events, religious activities that we define. Inside of particular activities. Yeah. And that he's he's not there when you're listening to someone, and he's not there when you're you're just yeah, working, absolutely, or serving, you know, absolutely. Good insight. And that insight. that contributes to just becoming very unchristian the moment you step away from these activities because you aren't taking that mindset of this is holy. You take that mindset and you spread it like butter across your whole day. Yeah, yeah. What were you saying, Angel? Double-minded. Double-minded. Yeah, that. that's exactly what it is, Cindy. Um, was had to do with what Angela was talking about. Speak louder. Or no, what you were mind. talking about, where you said um, people are always sending you things. You know, and I do that occasionally, <laughs> not, not very often. And I didn't send you a sermon. I sent. You I wasn't like, kicking right? you under the bus, Cindy. No, no, no. I promise. I know you weren't. I was just bringing up that I do that sometimes. Yeah, but, I do too. But I was thinking, you know, when you're sitting in church, uh, at least this is, was for me sometimes. I'd be sitting in church and listening to this great message, and I'm thinking. Ah, oh, this would be so good for my friend. They could just hear this, you know, you know? When you really know, it's probably what you need to hear. Yeah. Or the other thing is when you send things to people, because a lot of times whatever Yah gives you is for you. Yeah. It's in your moment. It's whatever yeah. you're going through. And you can share it with somebody else, but they might be on a completely different page. I, yeah, I totally you know understand. I, mean? I, I some, agree. Sometimes it's good to share. but It is. And, you know, you're right. I think sometimes, you know, I have said many times before it's kind of like that thing it's like the inverse of that thing where you see um like in the political world today where the evil that these men are doing they actually accuse somebody else of doing it to like deflect or something this is like the inverse of that where it's like i feel like this person is talking to me and rather than um do what I need to with that information, I think, man, that's a powerful message. That's for somebody else. <laughs> I f completely let it go right over my head that no, 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 God was trying to talk to you and you did one of those responsibility diffusion things that I talked about last week and you said, wow, what a great message. She needs to hear that. He needs to hear that. And when I should have been saying, whoa, 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 I probably ought to sit with that message for a little while and think about it. I would like to just, before I go to Bob... But I only send you really good stuff. No, of course. I totally understand. <laughs> I want to... Keith just recommended that you check out Joel Richardson if you have an uh, inkling to uh, look at how uh, Islam might play into end time stuff. That's a great idea. I want to recommend to you that you take a look at a particular message by Halisa Aylwine. And it's called, Can You Say Thank You? I have been listening to that message on repeat for three weeks because it is so powerful. Cynthia, will you hand that microphone to Linda to hand back to Angela? I strongly recommend that you I listen. I have a quiz for you about that message. What is it? Um, She said there were four things that yes. get in the way yes. of gratitude. And one of them, Cindy was just talking about, a failure to see yourself. Self-reflection. Self-reflection. Right? So that will make you an ungrateful person. But there are three other things that make it impossible for you to be grateful. Do you remember what they were? What are they? I uh, number one is that you have an, a sense of entitlement. Number two is you're lacking you you self-reflection. Uh-huh. Number three is that you, what, what, what'd you 
a self-reflection. You have the inability to see your own weaknesses. You can't see inside yeah. yourself. You think you're great just you're the blind. way you are. Yeah, you think you're great just <laughs> as you are. You have a, you're, you're, you're nose blind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, number three, I, I, uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Do you know? I think, one, wasn't it victim? Yeah, you, you perceive yourself as a victim. Yes. You always see yourself in the victim role. That's another great one. These are all ways in which we are ingrates. We have no ability to be thankful. And she has pur purported in this message to say, if you are not thankful, it's very hard for you to be humble and actually achieve repentance. Yes. It, it is a tremendous, tremendous Bible study. What was her name? Holy Sa Yeah, those qualities are emotionally Yeah. Most people are familiar with Halisa Alewine. Uh, she does the creation gospel stuff. But there's a me the message is called, Can You Say Thank You? Fantastic message. I strongly encourage you to take a look at it. You can absolutely send a link. Yeah, we can add that to the Discord. Uh, if you'd like, we can absolutely add that to the Discord. Can You Say Thank You by Halisa Alewine. It's pretty easy to find. I it is pretty old. It's an old message from quite a while back. Uh, Bob, apologize, brother. Yeah, I've been sitting here for a while thinking about the beginning of, of uh, today's teachings and how it was said three different ways uh, about what was coming. Mm. And I, I was thinking about education and I, I remember as a kid growing up, I could have three different people try to teach me the same different, same lesson, but one of them would say it in just a way mm -hmm. that it actually clicked. Yep. Yep. Would that be what we were witnessing here? Yeah, that's that is certainly a good uh, a good option. I hadn't considered, Bob. I like your input there. That maybe. Yeah, that, because Yah is the ultimate teacher, right? And he knows that, you, I mean, Yeshua, look at what Yeshua did. I mean, he taught the same thing with like five different parables. Thinking, gosh, if you don't kick, pick up that one, maybe you'll pick up this one. If you can't understand that, maybe you'll see this one. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, I think that's an excellent insight, Bob. Um, I don't want to keep you guys too late. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I want We're going to have to tear apart... Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 over time over the next few weeks to, to kind of take a look at it. But we're coming to the end of the book of Zechariah and we're going to study something else. Um, but I want to, I want you to consider something as I, this is my parting thoughts to you. As you read over 12, 13, and 14 in Zechariah, consider this question. I think that the people of God have often very much missed prophecy and not understood it and had blinders on in regards to it because of what Angela was saying and because of what Lou was saying, which is they've got leaven. They have preconceived ideas about how things are supposed to look. And when it doesn't look like they have preconceived, it just goes right over their heads. The same thing happened with the Jews, where practically everything they thought was a metaphor turned out to be literal. And everything they thought was literal turned out to be a metaphor. They were completely backwards. Now, I have a sinking suspicion that when you have Yeshua come in the, in the great tribulation and the wrath of God and all this stuff, you're going to look back at that at the end of that and go, oh my goodness, the same exact thing happened to us. We, everything we thought was literal was figurative and everything we thought was figurative was literal. We, were, we had so many blinders on because we had heard so many sermons and read so many books and had our own ideas about how things were going to play out that we missed so much of it and didn't understand what was happening around us because we were so filled with our own ideas and the ideas of men regarding the Bible. We hadn't read it very much ourselves and we got so confused that we missed it. We left our curiosity, we left our curiosity at the door. Now here's what I want to tell you. I want you to consider... You know, I, since I was a child, when you read to some of these passages in the Bible, many of us probably still do have some very childish thinking that when we think about 
all of these visual images that the prophets give us, we're thinking like superhero movies and 3D effects from Hollywood. And I want to challenge you to look at the Bible, to read chapter 12, 13, and 14, and imagine to yourself, just take an exercise as you're in your Bible study time for the next week or so, and think to yourself, what might this passage look like if it was not fantastical, sci-fi, TV, 3D animation stuff in my mind? What might it look like in real life with real people, not superheroes, not flashy things that it seems to be suggesting? What might it look like if it was just more pedestrian? Angela made me uh, uh, think about this when she said, do you think it's possible that when Yeshua comes, we have all this language that seems like he comes in the clouds and he kills everybody. And from that moment on, everything's wonderful. I thought, boy, we sure have that idea in our minds, don't we? She's like, what if it takes the next thousand years, 200 years, 500 years? What if he does it gradually? What if he does it more slowly? What if he builds it? What if it's not, bam, there it is, done. I thought, man, that's, I had never considered that. Something to do. Yeah, right. So I was like, man, I just, that just never, I think a lot of people don't really think of that. You have some ideas in your mind about the way things are going to look and it's all very fantastical and sci-fi film kind of stuff. And then I'm just asking you, as you read 12, 13, 14, think about this stuff from just a very bland concept and see what happens. Osmundo, do you have something to say? Yes. Um, so piggybacking, piggyback off of uh, Maureen, what you said earlier about Israel, and kind of something what you're saying now. Um, we talk about, you know, the Jews in Israel, uh, and if you remember in, in the Book of Revelation, it says there are those who claim they're Jews, but they're not, and it talks about, you know, the den of devils. Um, then you also got to look at to the, if you pay attention to the geographical location of Israel, right, in ancient times. Because oftentimes we're so focused on the, the Israel that we see on TV or the Jews that we see on TV. Mm -hmm. But according to scripture, and if you look at the book of Isaiah chapter 19 and chapter 49, it talks about where Jehovah is going to call the children of Israel. Because he says he scattered them to the four corners of the earth. According to Deuteronomy 28, yeah. due to Israel's disobedience. So you're talking about how he's calling them from Assyria, from Egypt. Right, from, um, from Sinim, which right. is, I believe, China. Right, so we're looking today and we're seeing to ourselves, there's no Jews over there. Right. We so, may so, be mistaken. So, exactly, so being sensitive to your neighbor, because you know how the scripture says, you know, be careful, there's many who entertain angels and unaware. That's right. Let's just, let's just put that with Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Be careful because we're so focused on what we see on TV, mm -hmm. what we see in the news, but Israel's still scattered and Israel has not returned yet. So you may have a co-worker, you may have a friend that's actually Israel, mm -hmm. and you don't know it, but you're so focused on, hey, they're not the Jews, okay, I can treat this person some way. You've got to be careful because you never know Israel <clears throat> is the, where they came from. Yeah. Who they actually are. And you might just you might yourself be Israel and not know it. <laughs> I mean, there's a possibility. Many of us are. You know, sure. Because it, it talks about that usually after their children from the, the islands of the sea, yeah. southern China. That's right. There's, there's places that Jehovah said he's gathering, they have not <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I swallowed down the wrong hole. Um yeah, you're absolutely right. We have to be con conscientious about, um, you know, thinking that we know what's what. Because I think you're absolutely right that Israel, he talks about gathering from the islands of the sea. I mean, they're everywhere. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, I thank you guys for your kind patience. Uh, I know that it's been a long week and you have been so kind and patient hanging out with us and talking about these things. I want to pray with you and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up.